Yes, it's time to spend another bonding time with your instructor. Uh, I'm sure you look forward to these times just as much as you would spending time alone with your mother-in-law. I have no doubt that you look forward to these about that much, but anyway, you paid for it. You got yourself into this. Uh, just saying. Anyway, today we're going to look at phytochemicals and talk about what they are. Uh, you've heard about these, maybe not in the same term as phytochemicals, but you see them on advertisements and things, so we're going to go through and discuss how important they are uh, to not necessarily keep you alive, but they're very important for keeping you healthy. Okay, But before we do, we are going to go over some thoughts to ponder. So you're lucky you joined me today because these are things that you could discuss with your significant other, your spouse, uh, maybe your mother-in-law. Once you got, maybe you can't find something to talk about, and these possibly could be good things that you could get the conversation going, a good starter thing. Okay. The first one has to do with Pod's Law. I don't know if you've ever heard of Pod's Law. You can look it up. It is it is valid. Pod's Law is that if you have buttered bread and drop it, it will always drop and land on the floor on the buttered side. That's Pod's Law. So the first one deals with that. It says if you tied buttered toast to the back of a cat and dropped it from a height, what would happen? You know, cats always land on their feet, but Pod's Law, you know, who knows? It could land on its bread side. Anyway, if you're in a vehicle going the speed of light, what happens when you turn on the headlights? Something to ponder. You know how most packages say open here? What is the protocol if the package package says open somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Why do they put braille dots on keypads of drive up ATMs? Question. Why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways? Why is it that when you transport something by car, it's called a shipment? But when you transport something by ship, it's called cargo. You know that little indestructible black box that's used on planes? Why can't they make the whole plane out of the same substance? Why is it that when you are driving and looking for an address, you turn down the volume of the radio? I don't know. Things to ponder with your mother-in-law. Anyway, let's let's talk about phytochemicals and uh, get you going on your day here. Um, we've been kind of emphasizing plants throughout the whole uh, course of this uh, these lectures and I've tried to emphasize the more color you know we talked about color with uh, fish, we talked about color with plants. Uh, the goal of your life nutritionally should be to colorize your diet, especially plant-based diet with colors. There are different color categories that you can look into, uh, but um, they all are very similar in what kind of phytochemicals that they possibly would contain. Let's just go through and give examples of what the cat the categories you know what kind of foods would be in these categories white green yellow green that kind of thing so white greens basically are like onions and garlic soybeans pears uh, those would be in the white green category and I've just you don't have to memorize these names that I have listed below I'm just giving you examples that there uh, basically are many different kinds of phytochemicals but you don't have to remember that pears have quercetin and, and that kind of thing, so don't worry about that. But this is the white-green category. The yellow-green category 
uh, lutein, you know, spinach and, um, you know, broccolis, catechins, uh, those kinds of things um, are yellow, green, orange, yellow, the sweet potatoes, apricots, uh, limonene you've heard about, um, so orange and yellow kind of situation, reds, uh, lycopene and tomatoes, strawberries, uh, beets, uh, cranberries, you know, those, um, blueberries, resveratrol and grapes, you've heard, I'm sure that's been, been in the news for quite a while, uh, indole, red cabbage, you know, so when you choose onions and cabbages, the more color, uh, I mean, green cabbage is good, but if you can get the color of the red cabbage, the color of the red onions, um, they're going to have more phytochemicals in them. Um, so phytochemicals are plant derived. So phyto means plant, chemicals means, well, chemicals. Uh, and you cannot get these from meats. Uh, there are some that they're starting to find in meats. Uh, they're called zo zoochemicals. Uh, and zoochemicals would be, uh, you know, animal based. So we, um, they're doing some research on those. So there could be some possible outcomes where you would find some chemicals in, in meats that um, are beneficial for health uh, later on down the road. But now we're pretty much focusing on plants um, anyway. If I look a little agitated, it's because I turn my phone off, but it beeps, and it could possibly be my wife, so I'm putting her off because I want to finish this video. Don't tell her uh, that I said that. But anyway, um, so uh, plant-derived chemicals would be phytochemicals. They don't really, they aren't really important to keep you alive. I mean, you can be comatose and they can tube feed you and you can stay alive for a long long time but they phytochemicals are more important uh, protecting you against disease protecting you from um, like we'll be talking about antioxidants and we talked about reactive oxygen species and that kind of thing we talked about free radicals so this is where phytochemicals could come in to protect you know, from disease, not necessarily to keep you alive. Um, research populations consuming a plant-based diet of increased heart disease. So there's lots and lots of research uh, about uh, phytochemicals and and how a plant-based diet um, can improve those. I wanted to show you a little video, a YouTube video, uh, and uh, just talking about phytochemicals as part of our introduction. So let me get this going. Um, see if it works. Okay. Eating a rainbow of fruits and vegetables is an excellent way to derive benefits from all the different nutrients and phytochemicals that come in these foods. Phytochemicals represent the plant chemicals that include several families of different types of foods, including polyphenols and isoflavones and alanins and other factors that are health giving. But in addition, these fruits and vegetables contribute nutrients like potassium and magnesium and calcium and dietary fiber, all of which are incredibly important to keeping you healthy. When you start to break down the phytochemicals in various foods, they break into families. Um, the biggest family is called polyphenols, and there's over 4,000 phytochemicals that can be found in those groups. Cruciferous vegetables are vegetables that come in the cabbage family, and that includes things like cauliflower or broccoli. Cruciferous vegetables are recognized as having cancer-preventing benefits and enhancing the immune system to help ward off other illnesses. Berries are another family represented by phytochemicals. Blueberries have a blue color because of something called delphinidum, and strawberries, the red color, is both a combination of lycopene as well as elagic acid. 
These and all other berries have helpful properties that are associated with reduced risk of cancer. Herbs and spices also contain a variety of phytochemicals. One good example is turmeric, which is a very bright orange color. Another example of an herb or spice is garlic, which is part of the allium family, and it too appears to have nutritious and immune-enhancing benefits. When we're talking about a rainbow of foods, we're not talking about cheese puffs and fruit punch. We're talking about the fruits, the vegetables, and the herbs and the spices that contribute these beautiful colors and much good nutrition along with it. Okay, so uh, as you can see, she mentioned that there were 4,000 different kinds of, of the one type of phytochemical. So it's not something you can get in a pill. Phytochemicals have to come from food. Uh, and you can't depend on one thing. I know you hear on TV, well, we should, you know, get this pill that has lycopene in it. Well, that's great. That's one out of how many thousands of different kind of phytochemicals. So as we go through these, what, what I'm hoping that you'll um, get the idea of is kind of like we were talking uh, earlier about different antioxidants for the different kinds of reactive oxygen species. It's the same thing with phytochemicals. Phytochemicals, the different kinds in different foods, uh, are going to work on different aspects of preventing cancer, preventing heart disease, osteoporosis, who knows what. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that there are phytochemicals in foods that we have not discovered yet. Uh, I'm sure that there are things that are not there that are beneficial that we are yet to discover and the importance. The other thing about getting the phytochemicals in food is something else that we talked about earlier was synergism. And synergism is the idea of you know more than one thing working together uh, and uh, you know creating more benefits than if they did if you added them up individually. Uh, if they work together, there's more benefits than their individual, you know, sum, if you will. So it's, it, I'm hoping you'll learn that uh, as we go through. But let me just go through. Obviously, I can't talk about every single phytochemical. And if you read articles about phytochemicals, they'll come up with different ones and things. I'm just going to kind of go through and give you a flavor for and try to impress on you why plants are so important. Uh, but let's look at phytoestrogens uh, that you could find um, in the legumes, soybeans, whole grains, that kind of thing. Uh, I, as we go through, I'm not uh, so concerned that you remember the types. So don't, I wouldn't ask you a question on an exam of you know what is the flavonoid what category does it group in what is an isoflavonoid that kind of thing i'm more interested that you understand the activity and the food source so a lot of times i will put on an exam um, a, a matching category so match phytoestrogens to its activity or to its food source kind of thing so that's what you should be thinking about what what do i need to know as we go through so phytoestrogens detoxify carcinogens. Um, and so what that means is that they're going to latch on to uh, carcinogens and, and not allow them to be reactive. Um, not really like an antioxidant, but again, you're gonna neutralize any carcinogens out there. Estrogen, as you can imagine by the name, they're estrogen antagonists. Um, what they found is that they can be important for uh, women in preventing uh, risk of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, where the cells have estrogen receptors. And so um, phytoestrogens can be an antagonist to those because my information says that, that women produce more estrogen than they actually need. Uh, and so, um, the idea is to um, counter that 
then the foods that we eat, the phytoestrogens and stuff, will counter that because increased estrogens has been related to increased risk of cancer. Not so much initiation of the cancer, so they're not like a carcinogen, but they're more like a promoter, which would encourage the speed of the growth of a cancer. Um, once it gets started. So the phytoestrogens will uh, reduce that risk of increasing the speed. It doesn't really stop the initiation of cancer because that's going to be come from something else, uh, but it reduces the speed as an antagonist to that. Um, you will read some issues about whether um, estrogen, phytoestrogens would uh, increase the possible um, expression of estrogen in in boys or men kind of a thing. It's kind of controversial whether yes or no, but there are some studies out there that you might look at yourself as to whether we should be feeding uh, little boys uh, a lot of soybean-based uh, products and things like that. So research that for yourself. There is some controversy on that as to whether it would increase um, and, and add too much estrogen during their growth period, uh, that kind of thing. So check that out. But so one type of phytochemical, phenols, I mean, there's many, I should mention, there are 4,000 or more types of phenols, um, but you find them in blueberries and peppers and things like that. Um, they are antioxidants and, um, you know, they are not detoxifying enzymes, but they induce or increase the production of detoxification enzymes. Um, so, you know, blueberries are very good and peppers are very good, but also, you know, grapes, the resveratrol and all that are coming to this category. So, um, you know, important, uh, a lot of phenols, but very important to get those. Uh, here, I, I guess I have the food. Uh, listed blueberries, grapes, raspberries, peppers, things that are blue and red uh, seem to be, have a lot of phenols in them. Uh, carotenoids, uh, you've heard of beta carotene, I'm sure, and probably lycopene, but uh, you know, a lot of yellow and orange kind of fruits and vegetables. Uh, they are basically antioxidants. I hope as we go through, you understand I'm just giving you kind of one or two aspects of their activity, just enough to, you know, for you to have to remember, I guess. Um, but they do more, okay? If you read up on carrots and, and phytochemicals, you would find that um, there's more that they do. There's more phytochemicals, but I'm just kind of uh, giving you a flavor for this uh, in this lecture. But so again, red, orange, uh, yellow kind of uh, vegetables. Uh, terpenes, limonene, uh, anti-cancer kind of things. So uh, the alcohol you'll find in cherries, uh, that kind of thing. So citrus oil, cherries, garlic, um, organosulfurs. The, these would be in their cruciferous vegetables. The reason they're called cruciferous is because they're blossoming. It looks like a crucifix. And so they call these cruciferous. So they're the broccolis, the cabbages, uh, um, Brussels sprouts, those kinds of things would be considered cruciferous. And then also we can include in this category leeks, onions, garlic. But, um, you know, again, anti cancer kind of things. Uh, phytosterols, food sources would be nuts and seeds. Um, so, Again, dealing with cancer, dealing with cholesterol, so there's many different kinds. So there are benefits to oils. You just have to uh, minimize because they will add calories. Okay. So anyway, Jane Brody, uh, kind of a famous author, I guess, is um, kind of advocating the power of plant-based chemicals. Uh, again, these are in addition to the nutrients that they contain, the vitamins and minerals. Uh, you may hear phytochemicals, I think I may have mentioned this before, called phytonutrients because it kind of has more of a relevance for people to say, ooh, they're phytonutrients as opposed to chemicals. They're not really considered part of a nu nutrient category. 
because they're just ke they're chemicals at this point. But uh, in advertising, if you said, oh, they have phytochemicals, the chemical part is, I don't know, people don't get drawn to that. But if they're a phytonutrient, then people get drawn to that and they, they will uh, take a little more listen to that. But again, the idea is getting them from fruits, fruits and vegetables, get, encouraging people to eat more fruits and vegetables, that kind of thing. And some of you that have had some genetics and, and looking at genetic expression, they're also starting to look at, um, you know, a, a, a category of genetics that, you know, interests me is called nutrigenomics. It's how nutrition affects the expression of genes. So uh, they're also finding that not only nutrients affect uh, gene expression, but phytochemicals affect gene expression. Uh, so who knows what other things besides anti-cancer and anti-heart disease and stuff that phytochemicals are a part of. Uh, they could be a part of um, someone uh, realizing their genetic potential. Uh, and if they're not getting the phytochemicals in their foods, then they may or may not reach their genetic potential and whatever that is. It doesn't mean they're going to be tall or whatever, but maybe their immune system doesn't. Uh, express as well kind of thing so just throwing that out there to again try to encourage you to get more than the lettuce on your hamburger uh, as a plant source so what's the difference between snot and cauliflower kids will eat snot but they won't eat cauliflower oh okay Functional foods, I know you've heard about these, but you really didn't hear the terminology related to functional foods, uh, but they're foods that do have some kind of health benefit, either added or natural, uh, but it, it goes beyond, uh, basically goes beyond nutrients in some cases. Uh, it goes uh, into uh, ergogenic, you know, making you more active and making you feel better more energy kind of thing or it also goes into the herbs and things like that so I want to go through some terminology with you just so you have it and uh, talk about functional foods uh, unmodified foods so these would be foods that nobody has done anything with but they have an extra benefit besides nutrients uh, and so they provide in a, a physical benefit uh, naturally that goes beyond nutrients and so the phytochemicals are not classified as nutrients so they would be in this category omega-3 fatty acids go beyond just being a lipid because they're going to um, reduce the risk of heart disease and then the fibers for colorectal cancer and, and those kinds of things so those are naturally in whole grain foods that go beyond the vitamins and minerals that they have in them um, nutraceuticals, um, things that have uh, been modified. So you've add, added something to the food to improve its health or performance. So nutrients like, like orange juice with calcium would be an example of um, some benefit. Why did they do that? Because calcium likes an acid environment. So they add it to orange juice because it's acidic. Uh, and then you also see they add vitamin D because, as we mentioned before, vitamin D and calcium kind of work together. So, but, but that would be something that you would add additions because orange juice doesn't really have a lot of those. Herbs, echinacea, you know, the added to juices, um, you know, the added the herbs, you know, that would be considered a nutraceutical. Ergogenic would be some kind of, of uh, food that would say that they increase your energy. Now, whether these work or not uh, is different. Echinacea, you know, you have a controversy on that because there hasn't been a lot of double-blind studies on echinacea. And then the energy bar, I mean, could it be a placebo? kind of a thing that's a possibility but and then you have to really look at the power bars to whether they have a lot of sugar and things like that so be very careful when you buy those but all of those because they have uh, or they advertise as being something more than the food nutrients 
then uh, they would be a nutraceutical. Probiotic foods, these would be foods that um, have actually living organisms in their live micro uh, biological cultures. We introduce those a little bit when we're talking about the oligosaccharides. Uh, but uh, yogurt, if you look on your yogurt containers, they contain live cultures. Uh, acidophilus milk has live cultures. And then you can actually purchase uh, supplements that are uh, freeze-dried live cultures that will come alive. Now these, these are uh, usually cultures that like an acid environment. The yogurt's acidic. Um, acidophilus is not really acidic, but uh, they can survive an acid environment, so they can get through your stomach and get to your intestines because that's where they're going to do their work. Uh, and they're going to be the friendly, the good good bacteria. Uh, if you do buy supplements, and again, there's pros and cons about supplements, um, whether you should take them or not, or whether they actually work or not, because they really don't know how many bacteria you actually need that's beneficial and would be probiotic. Uh, if you look at down in here, the potency, you're looking at a colony forming units. So CFU stands for colony forming units. And in here we have 5 billion per serving or per pill. Um, again, there's been not been a lot of of double-blind studies that I know of that is good, bad, or ugly. Uh, I don't think that they're, it's not going to hurt you to take them. Some people swear that they it works. Um, some don't. I have tried them. It uh, definitely changes the consistency of your uh, fecal material. Um, but the, the goal is that you're going to just keep um, uh, adding these uh, good bacteria and they will basically overtake the bad bacteria, the putrefactive bacteria, but you have to continue taking them every day. Um, so once you start a um, probiotic regime, then you're going to have to continue and take the, su the supplements every day because if you don't, they will convert back into a normal flora, if you will. Um, but uh, again, we'll talk uh, more about it in, uh, later on, maybe. In, in, but the idea is that they are going, because they're acid-loving, they produce acids, organic acids, that are going to um, change the environment of your large intestines or your colon. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but I would, before I bought supplements, I do a lot of researching. Um, there have been some claims of how many C CFUs a supplement would have, and then they get tested, and they aren't even close to the amount. So you have to really search out who is actually honest with these supplements, who is telling you the truth. Um, now I, I don't know if Nature's Way is good, bad, or ugly. I just found this picture. I um, wanted to explain a little bit about the supplements. Uh, the the main bacteria that you're going to see when you see look at yogurt or probiotics are going to be lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. There's many different kinds of lactobacillus uh, and uh, different kinds of bifidobacteria. Uh, the reason they're called bifido is because they have the two bifid they call it kind of thing. Um, but lactobacillus, both of them, if you look on the back of your yogurt container, they're live cultures of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. But there are people who specialize in these because there are different strains that are important for constipation. There's other ones that are more important if you have diarrhea. There are some that are more important if you have um, some kind of, of gas flatulence. There are other ones that deal with uh, if you have nausea that's related to your intestines. Uh, there are other ones that deal with a lot of different things. So there are professionals out there who know a lot about these that can recommend specific strains of these bacteria for a specific issue. Um, so you might want to 
before you just go off and, and believe advertising, you might want to talk to somebody that that knows about these and has studied these. Health benefits of, of uh, probiotics, uh, reduce pathogenic bacteria. Again, what they're going to do is produce organic acids and things, and they're going to inhibit the environment. They actually, the, when I studied, I did some, uh, my uh, master's thesis on bifidobacteria, and what it does is it reduces the pH of the uh, intestines uh, from about a 5.9 to a 5.1 and as if you remember as the pH gets lower and lower number you get more acidic so what it does is it acidifies the environment and makes it less conducive for these other bacteria you want to live there uh, and so the the probiotic bacteria kind of take over uh, and they uh, reduce GI attachment basically um, the putrefact bay will attach to the actual lining of the intestines and so they reduce that attachment and they out compete for space uh, and they reduce the pH. They have been shown in some cases to re reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. We'll talk about that later but and we talked a little bit about it when we talked about fiber. The longer the waste material stays in the, the colorectal e area then the um, higher the risk that they're the putrefactive bacteria are going to produce um, carcinogens or cancer promoter kind of things so um, it can help to eliminate those bacteria and uh, help reduce that increase calcium absorption because of the acidity calcium calcium likes an acid environment so that's a possibility increase excretion because a part you know a lot of your fecal material is bacteria so if you encourage their growth and get them growing you will increase mass of your fecal material and stimulate the sphincters and yeah well that's as far as we need to go on that uh, decreased triglycerides um, so um, one of the things that you may remember your doctor may have recommended when you were taking uh, antibiotics is to eat yogurt well what they're trying to do is because if it's a broad spectrum antibiotic it's going to kill all bacteria and uh, so uh, you need to replace those because the uh, intestine is going to produce some some um, uh, vitamin D and some biotin and some different things like that so um, or vitamin K, I'm sorry, not vitamin D, vitamin K and some biotin and things like that. So um, replacing those with good bacteria. So obviously you wouldn't want to replace them with E. coli or something that putrefactive, but replace it with good bacteria as you're on the antibiotic theory, especially if it's chronic or long term. If you have digestive disorders like constipation or diarrhea or uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm I'm assuming that it could be beneficial if you have some type of um, intestinal intolerance uh, to different things, uh, in, in, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or something. It's possible that they could um, uh, help in that aspect, and then. Uh, they have been shown to increase your immune response, that kind of thing. So, a lot of benefits. And these are, I mean, there's a whole textbook written on these. So, I hope you understand this is only touching the surface of their benefits. Uh, what's going to encourage their growth is prebiotic foods. And prebiotic foods are uh, foods that, by definition, are not digestible because you don't want them to be broken down and absorbed. You want them to get to the large intestines so that the bacteria will get them. And but they are they are foods that probiotic bacteria are going to like, uh, and they are going to eat. So it again it, it helps encourage their growth. So if you take a supplement, the the idea would be to also eat prebiotic foods that are going to encourage their growth so it's kind of a combo type of thing but these prebiotic foods are going to have to resist digestion uh, so they're going to have to like acid conditions of your stomach and be able to go through that they're going to have to be fermentable by the the bacteria 
uh, and they're going to be beneficial to the host's health. Uh, <clears throat> so these are some, some of the conditions that you would have for prebiotic foods. Uh, what are some examples? Well, anything that, oops, sorry, anything that has uh, FOS, if you look at the supplement, and I guess I should have brought it up, if you look at that supplement bottle, normally they will say added FOS. So that just means um, fructo oligosaccharides is what FOS kind of stands for. But they are going to be added just because it's going to give it that stimulus of food for those bacteria once they start becoming active but there's lots of different kinds and you will only find them in plant products so another reason to increase plants in your diet okay symbiotic foods basically are uh, like if you have a yogurt or something that is has added FOS to it uh, then that would be a symbiotic food because it has both of them uh, in there um, so anyway, but um, it's best if you can, you know, get the prebiotics and the probiotics together. So anyway, so the <laughs> the real food plate is don't eat processed crap, um, and uh, that's it. So if you can, you know, increase your plant foods and try to decrease processed foods. Um, you know, the the one thing that I didn't discuss earlier is, you know, probiotic or uh, phytochemicals are kind of new. Um, and we're kind of about in the 1940s. Remember from history in the in the 1940s with nutrients, we knew what the nutrients were. We just didn't know how they worked. So we're kind of maybe in the late 40s, early 50s, probably of uh, phytochemicals. We know what they're there. And maybe we haven't found them all. We know that they're important for health because we've identified some aspects, but we really don't know how much we need. I mean, nobody knows, you know, how much lycopene do you really need? Um, so uh, the rule of thumb is to get your nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day kind of a thing. Uh, and that's the best we can do at this point. We don't know how cooking affects phytochemicals at this point, or else I haven't read it. Uh, we don't know how packaging affects. We don't know really. I mean, freezing doesn't seem, especially if it's quick frozen, doesn't seem to to uh, affect phytochemical uh, things. But uh, how much does how much does heat affect it? How much do you know, oxidation, those kinds of things. We really don't know as much as we will, you know, down the road. So again, the, the only recommendation that can be given is to get at least the nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Okay.